Thank you, Paul. That was an incredible introduction. Um, as you mentioned, my work is three-dimensional. I paint physically in real spaces and on top of people to make them look like a two-dimensional painting. From every possible direction that you would photograph this work, the illusion maintains. It's not viewpoint dependent. All of this is done just with my paintbrush directly on the skin of the model or on the backgrounds. None of this effect is created digitally. A lot of people wonder if I always knew I wanted to be an artist. And the answer is definitely no. I didn't think I, didn't think I had any artistic talent growing up. Any time that I would try to make something, I couldn't finish it. And that's particularly evident in this self-portrait. I just kept overworking the eyes, so much so that my color pencils broke through the paper, and I had to glue paper behind it to try starting over again. And I never managed to finish it. My last self-portrait that I painted on canvas, I got so frustrated that I couldn't make what I saw in my head on the canvas that I actually started crying and I reflected that in that self-portrait. I had a different passion growing up. I was obsessed with politics. I thought that I would run for Congress one day. I'd spent four summers interning on Capitol Hill. I did press for the Obama campaign in 2008, and I had geared up my whole life for this really particular tract. But then, one day, I realized, what if I want to do something other than politics? I didn't have experience in anything else, and I felt incredibly trapped. It was my senior year of college, and I decided this is my opportunity to just do something completely different. And I decided at that point that I would become a furniture designer. I started learning how to woodwork and how to weld, and I had to be enrolled in a sculpture class in order to use the facilities to make my furniture designs. It was in this class that I was given a homework assignment that changed the course of my life. I was asked to make a sculpture about a landscape, but it was not allowed to be a sculpture of a landscape. This made no sense. It still doesn't make sense. <laughs> and when I asked the teacher for clarification, he refused. He told me I needed to just figure it out for myself. The idea I came up with was to put black paint down on the shadows. And that would be a way of describing the landscape through the obstruction of light. So you could have information about this tree that's over there through the shadow that's painted directly on the grass. My professor hated this idea. He told me that's not what he meant by the assignment. And I had to do something else to satisfy it. I ended up making a cardboard house and a cardboard hill. And I got an A. But there was something in me that just really wanted to explore and see what would happen if I did try painting on shadows. And I tried doing all of these experiments some of which involved taking a human being and putting the mapping of light and shadow directly on them in grayscale. I realized that this was able to do weird things with spatial depth cues. I thought something was wrong with my camera, and I kept on trying to take photos from all angles, and somehow my friend looked like a two-dimensional painting no matter what I did. I went back to that same professor and showed him these photos, and I was so excited but his response was, well, if you could have done that in Photoshop, why did you bother doing it in real life? That looks like you just Photoshopped eyes onto a painting. And I tried explaining to him that, no, I think there's something here. I really want to explore this. And he's like, ah, that seems like a very roundabout, inelegant solution to an already solved problem. I decided that I would make it my job to try to solve this problem and see what is going on that can make the three-dimensional space appear like a two-dimensional painting. I just graduated from Vassar College, and I went back to my home in Washington, DC. And rather than trying to get a job on Capitol Hill, as had been my plan, I decided to teach myself how to paint through the process of painting on myself, or painting on grapefruit, or painting on a plate of eggs. A lot of my early subjects were inanimate objects or myself because all of my friends had real jobs. <laughs> they didn't understand when I told them that I was in my parents' basement putting paint on grapefruits that I was being completely serious. <laughs> if I wanted to paint someone other than me, I'd have to find somebody else who uh, was not working a nine to five 
And so that ended up, in one case, being a retired gentleman. Now, this painting was um, in preparation for an art exhibit that I had in Washington, DC. I was really excited to be making my debut in a gallery that I would be having a painted person on display for people to finally see. I'd be coming out of my parents' basement. At the last minute, I wasn't able to get a ride, and I didn't know what to do. This was the days before Uber and Lyft, and I decided that I would get to that art show no matter what. I ended up taking my painted model on the DC subway. <laughs> and I was mortified. <laughs> People were very confused and very uncomfortable. And I felt really bad that I was causing all of these terrible feelings in a lot of humans. I was so embarrassed, but I kept snapping photos. And what came out of that ended up being one of the most iconic images of my entire career. This picture launched me to internet virality, and all of a sudden, overnight, people knew my art and my work. And it wasn't because of the presentation in the gallery, it was because of this chance occurrence on the DC subway. Since then, I've gotten a lot more comfortable bringing my models out into the real world. So something that's really cool is that when you're working with humans as your canvas, sometimes very human things end up happening. This is real, and she has no idea what's going on. <laughs> I thought she was saying no. <laughs> I was just like, that's so terrifying and the worst way to have your heart broken. But it was a yes. <laughs> um, and they're now married and have a baby. Another fun project I did uh, was in collaboration with dancers John Boogs and Lil Buck for the short film Color of Reality. definitely can't do that. Uh, Will Buck is so talented. You can see the rest of the short film online. Um, but another project I want to share with you all is my collaboration with Sheila Vand, a performance artist. I put paint on her body and then put her in a pool of milk. And the colors started fading and going into the milk to form these unpredictable patterns all around her. We weren't able to control what would happen, where the colors would go. It would be beautiful one moment, and then the next, all the paint would be washed away. I did this body of work with Sheila in 2012. And then last year, it caught the attention of a music video director who asked me if I could do this with a pop star. And it turned out that was Ariana Grande. And I ended up painting her for her God is a Woman music video. So I knew that Ariana was a major pop star, but I was not prepared at all for what happened next. The internet went totally crazy. People started tweeting out at Lush saying, I want to bathe like a goddess. Give me purple bathtub water. And they answered their prayers. <laughs> and you can now buy a bath bomb at Lush to bathe like Ariana Grande. It set off a moment of a worldwide makeup trend of putting purple lipstick on your nose and cheeks. It was kind of cool because this very internet moment turned into something tangible in the real world, where people at home were now recreating this look. Uh, my favorite recreation is this one. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag God is a shrimp bisque. <laughs> now, a lot of people wonder, how can you see my work in person if it's all just photos on the internet or videos? And when I exhibit my work, I go beyond the traditional gallery experience of having white walls and a picture on the wall. I actually create environments that people are able to be in and become part of the painting. For my show last year on Rodeo Drive called the Merced in Wonderland, I painted all these different scenes and costumes that people were able to put on and put their own spin on the look, um, including dogs. <laughs> It was really cool to see people enjoying art of all different ages and backgrounds. People who normally would be told, don't touch that, are now fully immersed in it. <laughs> um, I'd say there were a lot of really amazing dogs that came to the exhibit. 
yeah, it was just so fun to see art in a place that anyone could access. Um, and it was for them. And you could play in whatever way just really spoke to you, uh, especially even to this dog. Um, as Paul mentioned, I'm going to be bringing back Immersed in Wonderland at this time in New York City. It opens on March 13th, um, which is very soon, considering that I have a lot of space to paint. <laughs> this photo was taken yesterday, and this is only one third of the space. <laughs> so uh, I got a lot of work ahead of me. Um, OK, ba back to my main body work, painting on people. I feel like there's something really special about capturing a human in this way. And when I learned about something called neural style transfer, and that now you can have an algorithm that can paint your pictures for you, um, I felt a little bit of uh, this pang of, oh my gosh, like my time has come. I've been automated. AI has made me redundant. And I felt like, you know, I'd been told before as an artist, the sky is the limit. But I'm literally limited. I have to be painting the sky on canvas, whereas neural style transfer can just turn anything into a beautiful painting, including the sky. I decided that I wanted to learn about how the technology behind it works. And I went down a big, deep hole of reading academic papers about style transfer, and then clicking back into footnotes. And I started reading about um, all different ways that people before this technology existed were applying artistic techniques to um, digital scenes. And that includes non-photorealistic rendering. It was a branch of computer graphics research in the 90s and 2000s that was really gearing up to try to figure out, in the absence of having the ability to make photoreal models, could we make artistic models that you could then animate and create um, this uh, animation that flowed better than a uh, photoreal model. Um, one of the things that I learned about in this research was about the uncanny valley effect. And that was something that I had run into in my career as an artist, trying to make things perfect. Even on painting on myself, I realized that it looked creepy and uncomfortable, and that when I just paint in a looser, more gestural style, the effects are so much more um, when I'm trying to imitate reality exactly to perfection, I end up with results that are far less desirable than if I'm trying to add my own artistic interpretation on top of it. And so I prefer to be painting my subjects in vibrant colors or in things far removed from what they would look like in the normal world. While I was doing this research, I learned about depth maps and about how you can communicate in a two-dimensional image how far something recedes into the background by a gradient of light. When I had the opportunity to be artist in residence at Google, I got to collaborate with the team developing light field technology. With light field, you're able to capture a volume of a space that contains information about the direction of all the rays of light in the scene. You can refocus it after the fact. You can also move the vantage point to novel places that the camera didn't originally see. And I was so excited to see what we could do with this. Um, to turn on the camera, you have to actually turn it on about 50 times and pushing all these buttons. <laughs> and then uh, you take all these images together, and you're able to create a three-dimensional model of the scene, which we then represented in a two-dimensional depth map. And because we could, we made the depth map in rainbow. A light field depth map is called a multiplane image. It um, sec slices the uh, image into planes, depending on how far away it is from the camera. I then took these planar, um, I then took this depth map and painted it directly on top of the real space that we first captured. And to pay homage to computer graphics research, I painted the Stanford Bunny, um, which was also visited by the Stanford Puppy. <laughs> and of course, since my main work involves painting on people, I had to do that too. It was an incredible team effort getting to collaborate with Google. And while the painting ended there, the work didn't. At that point, we then captured the scene again using light field. We were able to take all of these points of view of the 2D, 3D world and reconstruct it. And you can see when you push a little too far past it, then starts uh, breaking off into these slices. 
If you tried moving the camera viewpoint to somewhere that was not initially seen um, by the camera, you then start getting these crazy slices across planes. Um, and if you look at it in VR, it's incredible. One of my favorite things about it is all of the artifacts and that this is actual reality being turned into artwork. In addition to capturing the art with light field, we were able to use light stage, um, which is typically used to capture photo real um, avatars of subjects who go in there. In the case of my work, we were capturing something that already looked like a two-dimensional drawing, but capturing it in 3D. Um, the creator of the Light Stage, Paul Debevic, is right there if you have any questions. Uh, we then were able to take this three-dimensional avatar, which from every angle looks two-dimensional and seems quite uh, in juxtaposition with what you would expect from a Light Stage uh, high-fidelity photoreal model. And we were able to put that into an augmented reality experience. If you go over to the installation and bring up your phone, you can then see Grace reinserted into the scene, fully painted. We've also played with some other AR applications, and that includes taking the paint brushstrokes that I put on the model's face, and then making it so it's a mask that anybody could apply to themselves. There were some things that we had to figure out in the process. Like when we tried putting lighting effects on, it just got creepy. <laughs> And really part of the fun of my work is that I'm erasing sh shadow and shadow cues and painting over specular highlights to make things look two-dimensional. So it was kind of funny to see digital lighting added after the fact. Something else we ran into was the Uncanny Valley problem. If you look at how creepy those eyes are, <laughs> uh, we weren't really sure what the solution was. How do you make it uncreepy, having this juxtaposition of painted and real? And we decided to address that, to just put everyone in sunglasses. <laughs> there were also other issues of, OK, but then what about when um, you open the mouth, and all of a sudden there's tongue and teeth? And it's like, that is terrifying. That's literally the stuff that nightmares are made of. Um, there were also issues, too, with being able to see in such fine detail the pores and these um, attributes of skin when I'm trying to make the piece feel like a flat two-dimensional painting. And so we just collapsed all of that and went with uh, super basic colors. And I think that has led to a more effective um, view of it. So I find it really interesting that I'm using this highest technology that's able to capture the real world in high fidelity and represent it as if you were there, but I'm capturing something that's three-dimensional and looks 2D and presenting it as if it is two-dimensional using this same technology. So it's been a wonderful collaboration with Google, and I want to thank you all so very much. Thank you. OK, thank you, Alexa. We actually have some time for questions from the audience. If anybody is interested, we should use the microphones because we are recording this, and this will be available to Googlers everywhere. How do you pick the, your subjects to paint? Um, it used to be in the early days when I wanted to paint someone. I'd have to really beg and convince them that this would be worthwhile especially because in the early days, it was a really strenuous activity to model. I would paint all the backgrounds, clothes there with the person. Um, now I have quite a waiting list, and I have a lot of ideas and a lot of things I want to make. And so I um, think about who on that list matches the image I have in my head and pick from there. Um, have you ever made art uh, for a political campaign? I haven't made art for a political campaign before, but my short film collaboration, Color of Reality, was about gun violence. And it ended up winning CNN's Artist Impact Award, as well as was part of the National Civil Rights Museum's Freedom Award ceremony. Whenever you were getting into art and like everything was starting to kind of take off, like what were some of your, like what were some of the artists that influenced you to kind of like, fix your style and make it your own? When I first started painting, I wasn't looking at other paintings so much for inspiration. I was looking more at sculpture and installations that played with space. Because from the start, I viewed this project as something that occurs in three dimensions and looking at techniques for playing with perception. 
So I was really interested in the art of James Terrell and Robert Irwin as my main inspirations. I see you worked uh, with a couple music artists. Um, did the music have any influence on your pieces and you know the sound itself and shaping kind of the outcome? Uh, for the short film with the dancers, that music was composed by Wonder Girl and uh, Daniel Romain. Uh, the dance was choreographed to that, so that went hand in hand. Uh, with God is a Woman for Ariana Grande, we wanted to have imagery that felt uh, very evocative. And um, that is why she is in a giant shape that might feel familiar. <laughs> I was wondering, since you started in a different path and then went into uh, art, it sounds like you also got acquainted with like 3D modeling and like all of those uh, specific uh, details like specular, specularity and at the field. Um, what were you thinking about, for example, applying 3D to your 2D versions, but like in a more like a, the style of the a different painters, like Monet or, you know, that they do the little dots and with that, have you tried that working? I've tried. Um, applying many two-dimensional art techniques to the three-dimensional spaces mm -hmm. and almost no matter what um, aesthetic I'm trying to create, I'm still able to make the illusion work, whether it's to look like a pen and ink drawing or a Van Gogh painting or something more abstract or cubist. I'm able to use light and shadow cues with um, a couple of other strategies to make the space feel compressed into a two-dimensional work of art. I really enjoy your work. Um, it looks like you are doing actually doing real um, argumented reality where you argument the, the real uh, appearance of object and human. Um, so congratulations. Uh, I just want one question that um, have you tried other type of tool to, to paint your subject like brushes, the air brushes or anything like that, um, other than a pen brush? I primarily will use paint. Um, I like the texture of it. With airbrushing, you um, I don't know, it just makes me think of body painting and there's a whole history of body painting that captures things that I don't really like, including object objectification of women. And I'm really interested in capturing a person in their environment or in their clothes or their self-expression and things that, make, that are part of them. And that's really hard to do using airbrush since it's not made for that. Um. I'm sure you get this question a lot, and you kind of alluded to it, but is there like a link to your wait list for painting to, to, be, to get painted? <laughs> um, <laughs> you can contact me and I'll put you on the list. <laughs> for all this work, are you a one-woman show or do you work with a team to help some of these larger spaces? I'm, I have a team that paints with me and um, I wouldn't be able to be creating such large-scale work on my own. So it's really exciting getting to work with other artists to manifest something big. Okay, very good. So uh, with that, I would like to thank our amazing artist in residence for her amazing talk, Alexa Mead. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you.